uh, your, uh, your, uh, your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. My presentation was okay because I just pre recorded everything and kind of edited it, but I answered the question and answered why it was horrible. I could have understood and processed the question, but it's fine. You should have Zoom call once in a while, like I noticed that I missed everybody. Oh. Are you yeah. Hello, Hi. Yes, I was like reading the name Rosa. Mm -hmm. That's me, that's yeah. me. <laughs> Hello. What time is it in China now? It's six p.m. Welcome back, Zhao Zhao and Rich. I told you guys you would miss the visible the visible lunch group. <laughs> 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 Are we missing anybody? Oh, Wang. Wang is connecting. Okay. <clears throat> so today is the eleventh. Are there any other people missing? So Elena decided not to to join. I guess. And you, no. you have, okay, Deepak got an invitation. Yeah, he's okay. he interested in joining, but yeah. Deepak can be you know, <laughs> he's a tanky thing at best of the best times. <clears throat> That's fine. That's fine. Okay, I will give a little introduction before you start, Dylan. This is a historic day. Another historic day for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's a PhD Viva taking place over Zoom with a lockdown. So you're gonna you're gonna have kind of an unusual experience. You might even have some like network problems or some audio problems. You might have to ask people to repeat questions or even do like a reconnect or something like that. Uh, the other thing is your your thesis is very good, Dylan. It's it's unusually good actually. <clears throat> so uh, that's the that's good news. But nonetheless, the examiners are going to do their best to ask some tricky questions. It doesn't mean your vibe is, doesn't automatically mean your vibe is going to be good. And I hopefully have some tricky questions too. And I'm sure Rich is going to ask all the questions he got. <laughs> the, the other good news is though, you have, uh, and, and the other Visible Lunch members, access to previous practice virus, which is very unusual, right? That is, I don't know if there's any other group in the world, I've never heard of that before. It's something unusual and I think it is very helpful actually. So you can get some ideas of, uh, uh. but yeah, during the vibrant, don't be afraid to ask about like repeating questions, you know, can you please repeat that? I, I can't hear you or, or something like that. I actually had a job interview once over Skype and there were all sorts of technical problems and the interview didn't even go to the end because <laughs> there were too many technical problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. When is, when is the lens Is it the seventh? Is it the seventeenth? Nineteenth. Yeah. And the the time? Do you know the time of the Viva? Uh, Probably ten a.m. or something. Ten or ten thirty. Um, Around there. 
That's that's okay. You don't have to know the the exact time now. Oh, you might just send me a message saying his laptop was stuck in the uh, in the reboot. I see. Issue, I see. Okay. Yeah. It would be good to have Wong. <clears throat> He's here, though. Okay, so he is the, he is on the call. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. Do you think we should start, or should we should we wait another minute for Deepak? Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah, I don't think he's joining when he when everybody gets a chance. So I've been asked to make the presentation start. So twenty thirty minutes. Yes, looks good. Yes, thank you. So, my thesis is like the Asian Center Visualization for Center Data. Uh, okay, I'm just going to give an overview of the, the thesis and what I'm So, just a quick introduction. The uh, PhD was a uh, S2 funded project, which is part of the European Social Fund. And the idea is to uh, the collaboration between academia and, in and industry. Um, so all S2 projects are done with um, industry partners. So in my case, it was with QPC Limited, who are based in North Wales. And they provide core center infrastructure and data analysis for core centers that essentially collect a lot of core center data and all the metrics and things like that. Um, the thesis is based on uh, four principal projects. So there's a survey of information visualization box, a GPU scattergot application, um, a visual analytics application to investigate agent behavior and music lists, and a core diagram based application for visualizing or transfers. So the objectives and challenges of the, the thesis. Um, the objectives, main objectives were to help inform QPC of the data visualization techniques and of the state of the art in the field. Um, and also then to provide them with tools and techniques for visual investigation of their large core center data sets. So the challenges associated with this with uh, the literature explosion. So over the last uh, two years, uh, data visualization become more and more popular, and with that, there's more and more literature about the subject. So the idea is to kind of address this somewhat. Um, there's also the visualization of large volumes of data. So core centers, it's a, it's a huge industry, like four percent of I think the UK are employed in core centers. So the idea is they create so much data. So the idea is to be able to actually do something with this data to visualize and do something with it. Um, and this data is often very multi-dimensional, so that's an extra challenge and so the visualization of the multi-dimensional multi -dimensional data. And the data is also very connected, so there's a lot of connections within data as well, so you kind of want to visualize a, a large number of connections. Just touch a bit on the actual data sets provided by GPC for this um, PhD thesis, so they provided uh, a month's worth of data uh, from one of their clients, uh, which featured 4.9 million calls, collected over 43 sites um, all over the world, uh, including uh, Romania, South Africa, Egypt, uh, as well as the UK. And it featured over 6,000 pair agents, um, with the calls and these calls by companies, there's over 70 attributes for each call. I've highlighted two important aspects there for QPC, which is the NPS and CES. NPS, which is Net Promoter Score, um, is a feedback score that the customer gives at the end of the call, and they're often asked to provide a score from 1 to 10 for how happy they are with the call. Uh, this is only available for about 1% of the calls, uh, as it tends to be expensive to collect. So it, all, all, it provides like a, a ground truth of customer satisfaction. Uh, also then there's the CES, which is the customer effort score. 
which is a, a metric derived by GPC themselves and to try and ascertain how much effort the uh, customer made in contacting the call center. So if, if it was a short call, it would be very low effort, but then if it was a long call with lots of um, uh, holes and things like that, then they have to put a lot more effort into the call. And one of the worst ones is having speaking to multiple agents and having to explain their situation uh, over and over again it generates a lot of customer effort. Uh, as I said, this is a derived metric, and uh, QPC almost wanted to validate this against the, the net promoter score uh, just to see how well uh, the call rate um, tolerate him. Um, the thing with the net promoter score is that um, sometimes you just have unhappy customers, so you're not always accounted for, but generally it work quite well. So addressing the first challenge, which is the literature exposure. So as I mentioned, there's a lot more literature on data information realization recently. Um, surveys uh, are a popular resource for um, literature exploration, and there's even a survey of surveys, so like the academic side is well covered. However, information visualization books, uh, there's nothing that kind of like brings more together, so that's what this kind of chapter addresses. So it's the first of the kind introduction um, survey books that features a two-level uh, classification by reach and subject area, so that there are defined topics we um, were able to find topics of interest in which, in which books. There's a book recommendation provided, and there's um, valuable metadata included in the data set as well. Uh, this chapter was uh, based on a paper that we published at Computer Graphics Forum uh, last year, 2019. It was actually one of the uh, top 10 most downloaded papers for Computer Graphics Forum for the year. So uh, the primary classification that uses um, uh, what we do, that I perceive to be the target audience. So there's books that are yeah, classic data visualization books, so these are pioneering books. So um, you've got their times books and tough these books, essentially the early books. And then there are general audience books. So these tend to be quite picture heavy and just almost tabletop books. Uh, I think it's interesting to look at more than anything. Uh, academic based uh, and textbooks, so these are for more academic interests, um, industry professional books, so these tend to be for business professionals who want to present the data. Then there are specialized books, so on um, topics such as time signature, really specialized. Then I touch briefly on tools as well, although this can be a survey in itself. There's so many tools out there, so many books on these different tools. And the second level of classification I used was uh, based on the information visualization pipeline to kind of dis uh, visualize what topics were discussed in each book. So I have introductory topics and then the information visualization pipeline. So you have data analysis, mapping data to canvas, visualization techniques, rendering and interaction perception techniques. Uh, this is actual um, uh, classification itself. So on the uh, Y axis, we actually have the, the, the audience and then the books themselves, and then on the X axis is the topics, which are subdivided into small topics. And then you find the book and topic, the number explains the number of pages dedicated to that topic within each book. So, for example, if you're interested in color, we can see the color that is this book here, which is 194 pages dedicated to color. So, oh, sorry, 170 books dedicated to color. So, you can know what they are interested in color. This is probably the book that you're interested in and should want to look at. Also included is the sub-random next data, this is my favorite chart, is the, the table of the, the graph of influence that I like to call it. So on the uh, uh, x-axis we have the Amazon sales rank, so the further to the left there is the, the better sales rank. And the uh, citations, the use of citations on the y-axis, so the higher up is the more citations it has. So the interesting one to point out is that we have this topic here, which is um, Tufty's quantitative display of information visualization. I can't remember what. That's far more um, uh, citations, academic citations, than any other book. Um, in fact, all the, the top, most of the top 
one of the same three books. They're all, I mean, what we've been saying, you know, have six six books, essentially, so you've got to be able to be in the township, yeah. As well as Matt Ball's um, information, data visualization book, and directly data visualization book, and all what's that did. Then the best selling one, book well, in terms of sales rank, is this book down here, which is a storytelling book, which is as well as cited, although it is newer. And then find that quite uh, interesting. All right. Moving on to the first project of um, uh, the thesis, which is a feature of speaking the new system chapter box for the Golands. So this chapter is based on a paper presented at CPDC, and then I will try to extend it to a computer journal presentation in 2019. So the chapter is to address the visualization of large mass data scale. Um, so it's basically a critical tool for exploring large data sets. So it came around because I just wanted to see what the data looked like, what all the data looked like essentially. And it's almost the simplest form of um, seeing what the data looked like is a scatter box and one known and intuitive. So we can put uh, two variables on two axes to just have a look at the data. So that was the aim of the project. So here's just a screenshot from the project itself. So each point here represents a core and data set. Uh, we have got a time along the uh, x-axis and then the customer record score on the y-axis. And you need to, you can see like um, peaks and troughs every day, so the troughs at night and peaks in the day. This is where the fourth one comes in. Uh, Users are able to choose what axes they have, then you can box whatever they want. Um, and also, they can zoom in and interact with data. So, zoom in using the scroll bars on the mouse. You can zoom. You can see a zoom section into one day. You can see different patterns uh, appearing in the data. But we also wanted to uh, interact with data using um, Scientist Information Visualization Mantra. So, um, so an overview and then Filtering, so we've uh, provided filtering using GPU implementation to get a quick one. So, so it's a few tiny boards and <coughs> exactly filtering almost essentially. And then details on demand that if there's something of interest, they need to use mouse to uh, lasso uh, a call and get details about that call. Uh, also, there's a step box matrix overview as well to see all the uh, mm -hmm. Then from here, I moved on to the second project, the third chapter of my thesis, the main chapter of the thesis. So I uh, moved the focus to addressing the challenge of multidimensional data. So essentially, I expanded the last project to using this instead of points on separate blocks. Uh, the focus is also moved to actually visualizing visualizing the agents themselves rather than cores. Um, we have to try and find insights into agent behavior and to, to allow, allow visual analysis of the agent behavior. And the big problem here was that glyphs, instead of points, the points are all hot as it were, but with glyphs, uh, there was a lot of clutter. Uh, so I created a technique for clustering them hierarchically to and reduce clutter. There's a bit of a demo here. So this is an overview of the application. Here you can see the of application with um, glyphs representing agents with different variants of glyphs that you can use. Um, we have different variables mapped to different parts of the glyph then, which will also be changed. The glyphs themselves are covered by the business segment which they originate before originate from. And you'll need to see um, the different uh, metrics that can be chosen for different parts of the web. Um, there's a lot of customization that can be done within the software as well. So, for example, you can change the colors of the different aspects of the web. So, here we change the color of the, of the and then the 
levels of departments as well. We also filter in and out different uh, business segments the community focus on uh, different aspects of um, the data uh, and different business segments. Uh, as well as that, uh, there's an mouse over so that we can write details on individual agents and then we can pan and zoom similarly to what um, I described the previous stage um, and previous project so that we can see the more detail you can zoom in and then you can scroll down as an mouse view. Uh, so you can zoom in. Zoom out again, and from here, you can see it's still cut out and all the boxes. So, to try and address that, I created a lift clustering technique. So, the idea is that all the lifts within the screen space of the current lift they kind of merge into one parent lift, the hierarchical parent lift. So, this new lift then represents the average of all the lifts merged into it. Um, there's a number indicating the lifts are the most compared to the center. And then and there's a pie chart around the side of this bit of it showing the proportion of um, agents from the two departments are uh, within the lift. There's an also then showing all the average variables. Mm -hmm. So then these lifts then dynamically recalculate according to the zoom level. So if you zoom in, you see the lifts fitting apart. Um, so that you always have the filled screen space exemption. And these work on an individual access basis as well as so you zoom into the axes. As we zoom out, you now can see the lifts merging back in uh, into the lifts, so always making sure that there's no overlap to make the, the, the screen space available. Um, from here, uh, moving on to the third uh, of the project, which are interaction techniques for four diagrams. So, the aim of this project was to visualize a large number of connections. So, uh, there are, as I mentioned, 6,500 agents, um, and they were transferred for three months out quite often. So, we can visualize the network transfers. <coughs> So for this, they used a four diagram based design and they see the logical agent of uh, all the agents from the outside and passing and showing lines connected to all the infection. So another overview, as mentioned here, we've got all the agents around the outside grouped into the departments and business segments. So the lines are coming according to the uh, business segments and departments which we can transfer to information from. And the line goes down to different departments. So, the clustering technique that you see here can be adjusted. So, this um, hierarchy line comes down. So, if you try and reduce the amount of lines and screens, it looks not so effective. There's also a, a mouse over option that uh, can focus on one of the departments, which kind of reduces the clutter a bit, uh, although not entirely. So, for example, you see a uh, number of sales departments, you see the transfers. And um, also, we used to um, uh, try and reduce better is a inter department section so that for transferring two departments are shown outside of the circle rather than inside. All right, so to, be able to focus on the new like, um, mm -hmm. to like the a definition that we uh, was created, which performs the four diagram itself. So that we really look like see individual agents and the four is transferred in that by the two individual agents and they can see us showing some of the individual agents as well as some metadata about them, what the agent is and how many transfers you make and some average four times and things like that. There's still some ambiguity however about whether the lines show the four kind of in or out. So to address this I have some arrows. We can see the, the direction of the transfer. Uh, as well as this, there's also an animated version as well. So to see balls coming in using this animated black line. And then the final main chapter of my thesis was just a, a, a software chapter essentially. Um, I provided open source um, implementation 
of the technique used in the this application. <coughs> so it uses geometry shaders to uh, render the scope lifts. So essentially, it passes the data into the um, pipeline to create individual lifts for each of the agents. Uh, and then, like, create a um, self contained open source simplified version of this um, to demonstrate it. And this is uh, such a publication that CGECVIP and um, the conference now is not done. So, in summary, um, the thesis presents a survey of information visualization books as well as three applications for the Jan Analytics for the center data. So, there's a scatter plot application which uses GPU filtering. There's a glyph based agent visualization tool which uses glyph merging to reduce clutter. And then a deformable core diagram to visualize core transfers. As well as that, then, is the uh, open source implementation which I've added. And that uh, concludes my presentation. So, that's the end of the presentation. Well done. Oh, do you see another one? Uh, my computer was stuck in restart, so I joined late. Oh, okay. <coughs> How far in did you join? Um, maybe middle of the past uh, after. No, okay. Maybe five minutes. No. So, comments and questions, please. Yeah, why don't we start with the questions, like questions that you could get during your Viva from the examiners, and then we'll go into some comments afterwards. Anybody want to start? I, I mean, I have a list of questions, but Rich, I hope you have your, I'm sure you have, you remember all your questions that you got. <laughs> Thing is, they're all specific to the thesis a lot of it. So okay. Because I don't really have uh, doing thesis. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've got some questions. Good. You want to start? Cool. Um, I remember my thesis. They asked me a question at three, and it was essentially why do you choose? So they they asked me. I think it was sort of the inverse of it. Um, why do you choose a core diagram over something like? Um, uh, the elementary, other elementary tools such as I, I think to show connections, so essentially you're showing connection between essentially two agents or a number of agents. Mm -hmm. So the only way you can get it to work is using a circle as far as I in, in my head. So we have each agent represented, and because one agent, I guess you could have two lines, but then you have a load of lines push past each other. So it is a circle, you have essentially. They were all, all the agents are equal and they represented once on the circle, so then you see all the transfers between them. Because so I guess with two lines, you, you don't have to have each agent on both lines as well, so they can see um, yeah. and like that essentially. So I mean four diagrams are used to show connections between things essentially. This is the best um, the best tool for the job. That's one thing. Hold hold on. Um <laughs> Very good question. I have the exact same question written down in my notes, by the way. And I would, I would add to that. Yeah. I would add a few things. You would say something like, well, parallel coordinates has already been worked on. We, you would say, we were looking for something new, new, new to work on. Richard, the, the one and only Richard Roberts already worked hard on parallel coordinates. Yeah. But you can also add to that answer uh, that core diagrams are very good at showing the, the, um, the path amongst the different departments in the yeah. call center. Yes. And that if you tried to do this with parallel coordinates, you would not be able to see the loops. So you find yeah. lots of loops in, in, in these in these. Uh, you know, transfers between departments, and you wouldn't. Yeah. It, it's very difficult to see that. I don't think. I don't think that's even possible to see. 
with parallel coordinates. You can't see loops in parallel coordinates, right? Unless yeah. you unless you alter them somehow, which could be a future paper actually. <laughs> yeah. But th then you can keep going though. Uh, you can say, however, chord diagrams are not the only solution. There are other solutions that are possible. We we just we chose we chose chord diagrams for these reasons, but it is true that other solutions should be possible. So you have right, a you yes, have a double edged you have a double edged sword that covers both mm -hmm. both angles of attack. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I can mention metric based visualizations. Um, graph based some other graph based visualizations. You can also add to that I guess I got a good night's sleep last night. You can also add to that uh, what was I going to say? There hasn't been very much work on interaction techniques for chord diagrams. So we yeah. thought it was a good opportunity to explore that area. Yeah. 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 And you could, al <laughs> you could also add to that, we always have a chord diagram aspect in the thesis. <laughs> This is the first time we finished it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can leave that part out. <laughs> uh, good question. That I have that same question on my list, by the way. So, Rich, so, you, it looks like you got a good education. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Do you uh, do you have another one, Rich? Someone else could put on a piece of money. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Now my questions. I hope you know they're gonna. I hope they're challenging, but they all follow this why theme. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get the why, why, why. At least that's my. Do, do, is that consistent with your experience, Rich? Did you get lots of why questions? Why yes, did you do ways, this? Yeah. Yes. It's it's a, the why and the what. Why did you do this and what did you do? So you have to obviously be prepared for these questions about your survey. Why did you write a survey of books? Basically because a lot of those surveys have been done. Um, so there's a survey of surveys, so that most topics in the survey are already covering it, and then there's a survey of surveys covering surveys themselves and um, it's just a, an untapped resource essentially so they can often be overlooked. Um, books provide a lot of information, they can provide more detailed information than what we find in papers. Um, plus we have the budget to do it essentially, the press provided the budget that we were able to get the books as well as that and um, some books already available um, with the Bob. Um, and uh, we just thought they provide the valuable resource to the community as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good. That's a good answer. I'm just going to add a little bit more to strengthen it. Yeah. So you, I would say something like, well, the most obvious survey for this would be a survey of sort of business visualization. Yeah. But that's already been done. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, just like Liam did, yeah. We looked into different survey topics, but they've all been done. The the, yeah. clo the 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 related ones that we could think of, and then you can say there's even been an SOS, which was a big success. So based on the SOS idea, we we th we thought the SOB <laughs> would be a great idea. Because and then you would chat, you would throw in. There's an explosion in the number of books. That would be a nice uh, thing to throw in. It's in your thesis. You, you know, you're repeating. You'll notice that a lot of these things are just repeating from your thesis. Yeah. But that's that. The questions like that are still going to arise. They're going to. You might think, well, this is so obvious. Just read my thesis. That's that. <laughs> that's uh. That's beside the point. It's like to, to see what's in your brain, not necessarily what's in your thesis, so to speak. Yeah. 
But yeah, and, and you, you rightly pointed out, you said we had the budget as well, so all the stars aligned on this project. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted, you could mention that the, your survey was really appreciated by a, yeah. lot, a lot of the community. You got verbal feedback at Eurovis that yeah. people were appreciative of your survey and you got email feedback. Yeah. Which is, by the way, that's very unusual. That's really mm -hmm. unusual. Mm. Okay. Um, May I ask a question related to the survey folks? Yes, of course. Survey, so yes. I might bump this question in my thesis too. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree that survey folks is, is a very good source and it's a uh, part lots of like let's find people through this folks and I know you will spend lots of time doing this in your first year. How about how this survey folks help your thesis? You have you derived any like knowledge that you based your like chapters, the rest of the chapters based in the in this chapter? Um, most definitely. Um as I mentioned, there's a lot of resources in these books and just in terms of my personal learning. I, I learned a lot from them, a lot of different techniques. Some things were kind of bringing uh, counterpoints to each other as well uh, within the, um, the books. Um, for example, um, there's the, the data link aspect, so that the argue perhaps um, you should draw a minimal amount of lines possible to represent data. However, some of the studies show that having like visuals around the data themselves tend to help. And recollection of those graphs. So there's a few conflicts in there and stuff like that that I just learned myself again. There's many aspects of data relations of big fields and yeah, just to be able to actually create a really solid foundation of data visualization from those books themselves and also to actually um, impart that on to PPC themselves and to come to many objectives, especially for them, which is to learn about data visualization. Um, yeah, so it provides like the perfect foundation, like a really, really solid foundation for data visualization. You know, what techniques are there, what can be used, and why they use them. Um, yeah. Very good question and a very good answer. I'll just add some more there. Yeah. Um, one, one possible addition to that answer is that it would be probably impossible to get a more broad and general overview of the field any other way. Like you have produced the broadest and most general comprehensive overview of the field in the history of the field. You could throw that in there. And you can also throw in the fact that it helped you a lot with your, the GPU aspect of the, the GPU programming because during your survey of books, you came mm -hmm. across GPU programming books that were that provided valuable input to your to your implementation. Yeah. Too little, too little uh, additions to that. But that's a very good question. Very good question. I had not thought of that question. I did have a question um, I did have a question that's also difficult similar to Mohammed's is a survey of books appropriate so how would you <laughs> yes and if, so what if an examiner says, is a survey of books really appropriate for a PhD thesis? Yeah, I, I think this, I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of resources in there and the books are, most are written by academics as well. Some of the books themselves present a, um, like the Spring and Reefs present a series of um, uh, papers essentially related to one topic and one of them can Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
into any well-rounded big visualization at school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good answer. I will add a little bit more to that. Yeah. You, you could flip it on its head and say, why wouldn't books be appropriate for a survey? And you would yeah. say, I, we think it's a pity that these books are often overlooked in the, literature, in, the, in the literature because they contain so much more information than mm -hmm. what's represented in a typical research paper. Right? They don't have the same space limitations. They don't have the same time limitations where it has to be done in a hurry. They don't have necessarily the same budget limitations. So the, these, these books are a very valuable resource that some of the authors, like you mentioned, put in five to ten years of their lives into, and they're being overlooked. Right? So you, you can flip that question on its head and, and, and turn it into an asset, so to speak, and be like, it's a, it's a shame that this isn't, this isn't a standard practice or something like that. I guess I can say as well that like other graph shows that they are cited in academic publications as well. So you know, well cited as well. So yeah, the academics also use them. So it's important that they're represented as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions. Um, so this is one, this one really screwed me over my thesis too. I mean, my thesis as well as my life. Um, <laughs> basically, it was a, um, a question about my research methodology. So my approach to how you, um, so not, not necessarily in your literature, but more in the, one, the actual um, design of your software. Um, I had an answer to it, but um, Jonathan Roberts was not happy with my answer. Okay. Um, so so it, it, I put in about ten thousand additional words in my um, in my uh, <laughs> yeah in my collections. Um, do you yeah, so do you remember what the question? Do you remember what the question was? So it was essentially, what was your research methodology when um, creating um, this one of your pieces of software? So, as I mentioned in the presentation deck, that the idea was to put all this data. And so, first things first, best to see what the data looks like. And as I mentioned, the most intuitive way um, to visualize data itself is scatter plots. You can have two variables, one of these axes. So, we were able to see uh, the data itself. And from the all my literature that I read in those scatter plots and other well established and kind of intuitive. It just seemed like the simplest way of okay to see to see what the state looks like and it's just like any data set this and you really like great simple scatter plot for a lot of examples of it and so you know when you call it to see what it looks like in the data. And then from the kind of like the methodology put on it's like okay there's one set of data now that's kind of seen multi-dimensional, so that puts onto the second project, essentially. So, um, yeah, that was a design, design methodology, and then it's always it's like trying to improve it. Okay. The filtering is slow to begin with, so I implemented the acceleration technique. Um, yeah, so it was kind of like intuitive design in some aspects to be able to do those data and then try to do it. Do you remember what you tried to answer, Rich, or what, what Jonathan was trying to dig out, dig out of you? Yeah, it, it was something similar. I think, um, I think the, Jonathan was more after something about the scientific method, whether it was, you know, we have a hypothesis, and then we, we say we think it's going to happen in the textbook. And, you know, I think it was a bit more of a really structured, um, and, and, and how we, obviously our, our evaluation methods, as yours, is the same as the the main expert feedback, and that's how you evaluate the effectiveness. So, I think my analysis were, yeah, there, there were similar fields, and that was the process, that's what we did. I think he was looking for a bit more of a scientific. We had a hypothesis and we tested that hypothesis. So, and, and to an extent, we did do that in the way that we did it. It was just more of a, um, an agile approach to software development. It 
Okay, here, here is what I would recommend for that. That is a very open-ended, and it's a good examiner question. It's, it's, it probably should be put into this, like, the, the list of standard examiner questions. If I was in this position, I would then start talking about the, the collaboration between you and industry. So the research methodology is, step, step one is to understand the business. So it's like you, we sit down or, or you sit down or whoever with the domain experts to try to understand their problems. Like that is, that is step one of the methodology, to meet with the domain experts, try to figure out what they did and why they did it. And then you're trying, to, you're trying to document the questions that they are trying to answer with their data, right? So they, they develop the database software. They want to collect data. And there must be some reasons for that. So you would say we work together with these domain experts to figure out what it is they're trying to achieve, what are they trying to learn, what questions are they trying to answer, and that's the starting point of the methodology. And then step two is once you've got, you've, you've got a list of questions that, and, and goals that the domain experts are trying to address, you would say then begins the discussions about possible solutions. What are the design solutions, visual design solutions possible that address these problems and these questions and these goals? So you, you go through the, the kind of the question extraction phase, then you go through the design, the visual design exploration phase, and then you have to figure out, you, you cannot implement all the visual designs that you, it's not possible with an thesis. So then there's like a filtering stage about, okay, we have these questions, we have these visual designs that we believe can address these questions. Which ones are we actually going to work on in depth? And so that's a discussion that, and that get, gets back to your amazing um, dichotomy of interests paper, Rich. Finding the best compromise between the interests of the industry in answering their questions and your requirements of novelty. So you have a requirement of novelty and the compromise has to be found that matches both of the, both sets of those requirements. So that's kind of a methodology and then you complete the loop so to speak once you've when you're doing your implementation, you're doing this agile method with the feedback loop with industry. And then you would say something like, We're, we are so amazing. <laughs> we are so amazing. We record all the feedback sessions and they're all archived. And we analyze them afterwards and all that sort of stuff. And you can watch them too if you want because they're on YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Which is, yeah, I just mentioned that, I'm laughing, but that is super, super unusual. You guys don't realize how unusual this is. Like, we are the only group in the world, at least the only group in the UK doing this. Definitely the only group in the UK, maybe the only group, maybe there are a few other groups in the world doing this, but not many. So, yeah, that's all part of the, part of the, uh, the puzzle, but that's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's also related to this question. Uh, I, I think some of our work is just an answer to my question. I think some of our work is maybe this is what to the seminar supervisor in the next like, want to say. Is this is like we implement something to, for, the, for our customer. Is, 
Or you, as Bob said, you want something global. So my question, where you in this scale, is your like designed solutions came before because of a question by the domain expert, or you did some research to find the question, and then there, there must be some uh, uh, something you want like take out and you will take out something until you reach some solution between when you have this win-win situation. <clears throat> yeah, uh, that's a good point, really. Uh, as I mentioned, well, we've got that in some ways in that uh, QPC gives us quite free reign on um, what we wanted to produce. So they were interested in music needs as into that. We've got that in that respect as well, but they were interested in seeing how they could use as well so that they can learn visualization techniques. Um, as I mentioned, they did. Um, they were interested in the two things, in particular the electronic score, which I can find out in the presentation, and the electronic score. Um, other than that, they were they didn't have too many requirements of questions they wanted to answer, um, other than those two things. So, yeah, like I say, they give us quite a few range. So, we try to create um, tools essentially that just allows them to explore the data. So, um, there was a lot of feedback involved with them, iterative process and feedback. Um, but as to say, we're on scale. I think um, I think they were they were quite happy with some of the things we created. And we, we always kind of wanted more in some respects, but um, yeah, and we had some novel uh, interaction techniques that have been published as well. So I'd say we kind of satisfied the both objectives quite well in some respects. That's a good question and a good answer as well. I'll just add some things. I'm cheating too because I get to listen for a little while before I think yeah. of answers. It, it helps. By the way, you can use that strategy too and say, can you please repeat that question? I didn't quite understand it. And that will give you more time to think a little bit. But what I would say, I, would, I, I was thinking, I would say is, well, how do you, is there, is there an objective metric by which it's possible to measure the amount of, say, uh, applied research versus basic research, or, it, it, you know, or domain expert research versus pure theory or something like that? I mean, there, there is no objective metric to say this is exactly 50% applied research and this is exactly 50% basic research like this this doesn't this metric doesn't exist so again you try to flip it on its head a little bit but then you can add on to that you can say this was always a negotiation process and this is inherently built into this collaboration so the collaboration is essentially a negotiation process that Rich, Richard Roberts wrote all about. <laughs> to strike a balance between the interests of the industry partner and, and the researchers. So somehow we do have to strike a balance between these two. And the balance, the, the typical pattern is meeting with the domain experts, finding out what, their, what research questions they want to answer. And then the research experts typically are unfamiliar with the domain, with the data visualization space. So they are open to any suggestions, generally speaking. They just wanna see what's possible, generally speaking. So then when we introduce something novel to them, we, we try to explore the space based on our literature review and our knowledge to find out what, what are the novel things that we can develop that satisfy our requirements and then present those back to the domain experts. And there you strike the balance between applied research and, and, and like basic research and novelty, something like that. Yeah. 
but it is a tricky it's a tricky question it's a very good question it should probably be a stand like I should probably write a paper on <laughs> standard PhD viva questions <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If you file all of these questions, and you read after the five months, what what they ask you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Post Viva interview. <laughs> uh, okay. Other questions? Um. Again, it is more of a general question, um, but it's one that I would ask. Is that now that you've um, finished the full set of research um, and you've learned, uh, obviously you've learned a lot from the process, if you were to do that again, what aspects of the project would you have done differently? Um, it, 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 or the other, another way of raising the question is why do you think the weaknesses are in the research? Um, The um, I think the uh, the biggest weakness within the research itself, um, uh, highlighted by some of the readers of the papers, is actually the evaluation techniques used. So essentially, uh, they used uh, industry feedback, um, and perhaps this isn't enough um, in terms of user studies to justify some of the design you know, decisions rather than you know, uh, hey, this is good rather than having a sort of process with, um, with user studies and perhaps is where uh, the main difference, I would say, the main weakness, um, which was also highlighted by the reviewers of some of the papers as well. Um, although you kind of like set your data to the valid um, way of evaluating, but perhaps they had stronger ways to evaluate. So um, the main difference would be the that decision. What what did you say, Rich? Did you do you remember what you said? I, yeah, I said the same thing. I said that um, uh, the thing is because because of the way that we were working, it's mm -hmm. exactly the same way that we were working. Is that you know, we have to provide something that is a benefit to the company, um, so we have to have these main expert feedback sessions, and really that was um, that was the purpose of the research. Um, so it validates the research from. Um, the collaboration perspective, but I said that maybe it would have been nice to be able to do some maybe some more formal evaluation or some user studies or, or that sort of thing. But um, what this is a double up on some kind of evaluation that adds, you know, that's such a huge part of the research that the time cost could have been too much. And, and it, it would devalue um, the research from the industry perspective because then. It's wasted time again. A lot of the not the time you're writing papers, wasted time for them. There are so many factors that are wasted time for them. You have to find this balance between something that's valuable research and academic perspective, and also from the industry perspective. Yeah. Good that you're here, Rich. <laughs> so, just I some. <laughs> some things to add to that. I, I would also flip that question on its head a little bit and rephrase it as you can think of it internally in your mind as what is the future work that you didn't get to do that would have been nice to do. So I, I wouldn't have phrased it exactly the same way you did, Dylan, as a weakness is the lack of user studies. I would say something like, it would, would have been nice if we had had more time to add user studies to, to, as part of the evaluation. And, and the, the, you, can all, you can think in terms of future work. So, for example, you would say it would have been nice to add more u formal user studies as future work. Well, that's in the future work. And one of the other weaknesses is that we didn't have the budget and time to turn this into a full TRL level eight commercial application. Like the, the, the financial support system doesn't let us actually deploy this application in industry because that's the ultimate interests of QPC. 
you know, QPC wants to see this thing as a commercial product and they want to sell it. And this is something we were not able to do. And that's one of the so-called weaknesses. And about the user studies, well, there's, there's, there are two, there are a few aspects to that. One is QPC doesn't care about user studies. Like they, they want a commercial application. They don't want to conduct user studies. This, this application is not meant for general audiences or the software. Having said that, you might have an, exam, an examiner like Jonathan Roberts who loves user studies to be like, damn it, I love user studies. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and flames come off. No, that's not going to happen. But the, the, the classic counter argument to the user studies, is you, you wouldn't say user studies are bad and all that stuff. You, no, say like, you, I love user studies. <laughs> But the, the classic counter argument to the user studies is we're developing a very complicated piece of software for analysts. It's very difficult. The more complicated the software is, the more difficult it is to design a user study that tests the human-centered factors that are applicable to this system. A good user study is based on very, very simple tasks, like a very simple search query, a, t a task that can be measured in 60 seconds or less with a very well-defined error rate. In designing very simple tasks with very easy to measure task times and error rates is difficult in a complicated uh, analysis situation. So there's a, there's a con, sometimes if you want to design a user study with these nice tasks, it takes away, it, it's, it's a departure from what the analysts actually do in their actual work, right? It oversimplifies their work. So like to, to try to, to like, to say, let's design a user study that evaluates how, how effective this software is to explore the, the call center data set, well, that's a difficult user study to, to design because exploration is a very difficult task to define quantitatively, to measure quantitatively, and then to, to find the error rates, to, to, to measure the error rate. So that's the other side of the story. This is, this is a classic back and forth within the visualization community. Because there's part of the visualization community that's like, user study, user study, user study. And then there's another part of the visualization community that says, we have this complex systems designed for analysts. And it's not so easy to just design a simple user study for these complex scenarios where you're performing analysis and exploration. And then you would wrap that up by saying, but of course, it would be good as future work to try to design some experiments that, that, that go in this direction and, and perform more uh, a set of user studies, but it's beyond the scope of this thesis. You know, so it's a pretty long-winded answer, actually. Um, but it's a, very good, it's a very good question. Mm. Yeah, and Mohammed, basically everything I'm saying applies to you too, by the way. Like all of these questions, uh, the same kinds of questions you could get. Uh, yeah. Maybe you should record this something. I am, I am recording it. Yeah, I hope it works. I hope it works. This is worth millions of pounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question you're not going to get probably, but why not, just in case. How is your thesis different from Rich's? Um, the uh, data sampling, which primarily focused on the 
there is a small volume of data, this mine is my focus, so it's called a large volume of data. Um, and there weren't any overlaps really in terms of the projects created. Um, a lot of different aspects to the course and the data itself. Um, I, I wish that, for example, didn't focus on the agent aspect of the data and the course aspect. That's right. That's a good answer. So you would fo you would say we focused on a larger set of data, so it's more scalable, and it's an agent agent centered view of the data as opposed to a customer centered view of the data. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting question in some ways, and it's a it's, it's a unique survey in that most um, surveys are um, academic papers. So you're traditional looking at your academic resources like the IEEE Explore Library things doesn't really work so much for here. Uh, we're trying to carry over the main the main challenges really. Um, so just looking for information visualization books. So using um, Amazon as a, as a bookshop, as a bookshop as well, and the publisher websites really, and see what they have to offer on information visualization, uh, as well as that recommendations from the community, um, so the people can be going to think about the community and what to pay for say, um, and just all sort of connected them together. So the technique itself is fairly similar in that it was a case of see what's available using these search techniques and then kind of um, deciding how many books we have, what will be in focus, what will be out of focus, and then um, yeah, the categorization of them from there, and then the validation of the books that will be challenging. So how do you think of more freedom category? Like um, the... I, I guess um, it's just with all the books together, it's almost like it seems to be okay. You know, these books, this audience seems to be the obvious one, not when they have the audience in the forward, say, oh, this is book is for this. And it kind of almost came naturally in some of the ways that, you know, if your audience is an interesting different books and different ways the way books are targeted, basically, up towards audiences. Um, and then the actual level of detail in the books. Went into that kind of almost reflected that in some respect. Uh, so then, then from the keywords, we found how many times, like, um, how did you get, get the color intensity? The topics themselves. Um, topics and, uh, yeah. Well, it was based on the um, information visualization pipeline. So uh, there's a lot of introductory kind of chapters where they this generally discuss history, but that, that seems to be something that's quite common on the market books. And then it's just uh, in terms of like the topics of interest, like some were more focused on visual design, some were more focused on like rendering and mapping the data to canvas and things like that. So uh, it's kind of like the visualization pipeline is kind of quite well known and it's just been used in previous surveys. I think the survey surveys use a modified version of that as well, and it's used in a few surveys, so it seems quite natural really. Okay, so while I was listening to the answers, I uh, uh, came up with another question. Let me find out. Nine, five, five. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you are. Okay, maybe I was that. Okay. 
No, my uh, my internet connection is unstable apparently. Um, so there is some there is a mention of user study and the uh, part about it and uh, uh, and Paul said something about why you do it, uh, but uh, in the night and so uh, what what how you have done it. How many carry out in this study? Um, I get. I guess um, it, it would almost be a case of um, well, as Bob mentioned, the, the it's quite a complex task. It's perhaps not a uh, the application that I created for general use. So I guess. Expertise users, so the main experts are probably the way to go. Um, and the best way to actually do that would to actually deploy the application and see what works in a sort of agile software process. Um, but in terms of more basic processes, just trying to work out what's the best technique, for example, for showing um, the core connections. I guess you could develop like different basic designs almost using the user study then for okay, which design works best and design them with questions around um, what's perceived best, what's the uh, most intuitive for the users and sounds really on, on a more general basis to get like a more fundamental question. Yeah, so it looks like what's like someone um, like some user uh, study and suggest in their panel. Uh, like, uh, if you ask, like, am I thinking about what you might ask, like, um, like how did you consider uh, the users, and, like there's something called user-centric approach where we ask users what they want. Uh, so uh, how were they inside the loop when you designed the interface, or how did you consider uh, their expertise or preference? It was very much a uh, kind of like a feedback process where you uh, develop some things and then you have the interactive meetings with people see every so often just to show progress and they may kind of like explain them what they liked and what they didn't. So yeah, we very much went through that process um, and they kind of made suggestions as well and kind of like um, negotiate them, you know, discuss what solutions work and what was and can be implemented. And, and such a thing. So it's like a, uh, it's a way process. It's good Yeah, so if the stakeholders were involved in the design process, probably it doesn't make sense to do the test with them. And it's uh, hard to find new users outside the company. So probably yep. this study doesn't make sense. Uh, like, it's difficult uh, in this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. But you know, you you have that it's, it's always good to have an extra view that was making some aspects um, the more the more views the better, you know, there might be some culture within one company that then perhaps doesn't make the easy to create the best solution and uh, universally and there might be better yeah. solutions. I'd say it's an open question, it's probably a yeah. Um, so yeah, those are my questions. Thanks. Hey there, got a question. You're on mute. Yeah, I did. Well, my questions are all off. Thank you for my question. And I just want to start with the basic question of what is data visualization? I know it's very classic, so it's a very cute, nice and question. And we love that. The second one is, I don't know, maybe it's my one question. Did you offer our community for it to visualize in different data sets? Uh, what is data visualization? So it's the um, visual display of data. And um, so uh, looking at data in spreadsheets, it's it's hard to to make anything of the numbers essentially. The human mind doesn't work in that way. So the idea is to represent the data in a way. So information can be extracted more easily. So your simple data, say you've got those numbers, 
plotting a temperature, a graph showing a line of the temperature from other time with a lot better than some other numbers in there, and the data in the spreadsheet which works better even uh, from a human perspective. Um, the second question, uh, yeah, very much so. The, the, the data definitely works. You know, if it was a poor sample data, the, the, the designs are totally applicable to any data set potentially. Um, yeah, and quite as much as that, so don't there's anything like the solution can kind of works in any way. Um, kind of like how we design in some respects that way, but yeah, this, the, um, the challenges were data, multi dimensional data at scale. So, yeah, any multi dimensional, large, and multi dimensional data sets would do tweaks in terms of um, importing different data formats um, and different categorization of the data. Um, we have most definitely analyzing it. That's definitely a question you could get. Some questions you could get. Mm. Hmm. Other questions? How about how about why did you work with QPC? Like why did you work with them? Um, essentially the project was uh, was predefined before me joining it, <laughs> essentially. Um, so it's almost a case of the yeah, PhD the foundation was available to start the test funding essentially <laughs> so, um, to, to foster collaboration and to create to improve um, uh, South Wales values and West Wales. Um, well, okay, how about this? Why did QPC want to work with the Viz group? Why? What was QPC's interests? And as I said, kind of in my presentation, I kind of touched on that they wanted to know data visualization, what's available, what data visualization techniques they have. They have a massive data set, um, which they, you know, they, they wanted to explore essentially and to get the best out of it. So you can the visualization, they, uh, maybe they wanted to collaborate with somebody who uh, provide them with um, details on what's available, what can be done, and you know, the process, the data visualization process, really. And, um, yeah, I think they collaborated with other people involved and uh, yeah, it came through that way. That's not a bad answer. The, the, more, the more classic answer is they are in this situation where they're good at collecting data, which everybody's in. Mm -hmm. The industry, and not only industry, but the, like everybody is very, very good at collecting data. They're very good at collecting data. They're very good at archiving data, and data storage is very cheap. So there's no cost barrier in the way. However, the more data you collect, the more data you collect, the more you archive, the more you realize there's a gap between your ability to collect the data and extract knowledge from it. And so QPC ran into this brick wall where they, they realized this. They said, we're very good at collecting this data in our database. But we're not very good at actually extracting information and knowledge from it. What can we do about that? So then they, they looked for data visualization expertise that could help them manage their large data sets, basically explore them and extract knowledge and information from them. It's the same thing that happens everywhere. It's a very generic yeah. Uh, process that just happens globally everywhere. It doesn't matter which industry you're in, which yeah. topic you're studying, it's the same thing over and over again. It's the same pattern. Okay. I think Zhao Zhao has a question here. She was uh, a speaker earlier. Yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah. My first question is my question. Um, when you do the research and study a book, you know, I did a book, you do it all the time, all words. Um, uh, yeah, 
that before you ask that what Zhao Zhao what Zhao Zhao is asking if I understand correctly is how did you decide which books to include and which ones not to include so yeah. you had you had a very careful filtering and selection process which we discussed for like a year yeah so um, can you tell us about that filtering and selection process so <laughs> to be honest, I can't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a few years ago now. Luckily, I remember. Um, yeah, so I mean, we had our scope really, so it had to be uh, to a certain level. And I think uh, basically there weren't many books that uh, I left out that weren't in the scope. Um, so we kept all books, we decided to ignore. Um, Books that there's a collection of papers because um, there is so many of them and there's the volume, so um, those were left out. Um, scientific visualization books we also left out because of the volume of books there again. Um, so it was kind of a balance between focusing on information visualization specifically um, and uh, being detailed with those books. So I'm having you know, a manageable survey as well, so in terms of total number of books, so I think um, that's the process yeah, I went through. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct, that is correct. Yeah. Uh, let me just, you know, state, state it from my perspective. So we went through a very, very careful and lengthy discussion of the scope, which is exactly what you're asking about, Zhao Zhao, what books are included in which books are excluded. So there are two competing interests. One competing interest, one interest is to say let's include all books because that makes it a nice big survey. But the, the conflict there is if you try to include every single book it becomes unmanageable. You end up with thousands of books. 
So what we did to make the scope more manageable is as we were finding books, that the scope was constantly evolving, by the way. And this is fine to describe during the Bible. There's absolutely no problem with this. When we, whenever you start a survey, you don't necessarily know the exact scope in the beginning because it could diverge out of control or it could turn out to be too narrow. So our scope, when we started, was too broad, actually. So the more and more books we found, the more we had to narrow the scope. So one of the first things we did to narrow the scope was exclude edited proceedings and uh, books that were essentially collections of chapters all by different authors. So if we were to include all of those, the scope would have been... Um, you know, there would have been hundreds, if not thousands of books, and it wouldn't have been manageable. Another thing we did to make the scope more manageable was to exclude scientific visualization, just like Dylan mentioned. That's worthy of its own survey, I would say. And another very big step we did to make the scope manageable was the technology and tools section. We discovered that there are like 20,000 books based on Excel <laughs> and 20,000 books based on D3. So we, we had to just, we had to, you know, just highlight a few of the most recent books from those different tools and say, we can't cover this topic because there are too many books on this topic. And, but we'll give you a few references to the most recent popular ones if you are interested in this topic. And that's actually quite good because a lot of the readers, when they pick up that survey, they're, they're the kind of, a lot of the readers are thinking, oh, what books could I publish on this topic? I want to publish something that's new. So this survey gives them the, the opportunity to identify what what's not been published yet and, and it also gives them the opportunity to see what has already been published so if somebody says oh I think I want to publish a book on Excel they can see from our survey oh there are already 20,000 books published on Excel maybe we shouldn't do that <laughs> so that's kind of the that's the long answer okay. yeah <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do you now? Do you remember, Dylan? Yeah. yeah. May I add something? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I I think there is a section for books that they scroll. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. I think. Yeah, I think you mentioned all of this like infographics. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, infographics. That's true. Yes. Millions of books there. Yeah. yeah. I have a quite uh, technical question. Let's close the door. <laughs> Zhao Zhao has another question too, though. Okay, Sorry. can I ask now? Yeah, let, let's have Zhao Zhao ask her a third question. Okay, my next question is, based on what you did so far, what you have done so far, what do you think will be the next step on your project? Um, Liz, <laughs> I was trying to run the, it, it, it's in my uh, future work section. I think uh, there's always more work that can be done. Um, so as we kind of touched on earlier about um, deploying the actual applications into, uh, into the setting where they can be used properly and have some proper feedback on them and finding their flaws and, and developing from there. Um, uh, there's always more that can be done, essentially. Um, I haven't been a mental block, but I've got my, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I need to read my pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay, that's okay. I, I, it's oh, by way. the way, it's it's okay to bring a copy of your thesis with you. Yeah, yeah. 
and 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 uh, you know glance at the pages to refresh your memory. That's there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's but why it's just kind of uh, the future. Yeah. The future work directions are are pretty simple. They're pretty standard, actually. This is yeah. a generic, almost a generic answer that you can use for every single thesis. One is scalability. So to increase the data set size, you can say this about any database thesis in the entire world, right? Scalability. Yeah. It's the world's most generic future work direction, and it's valid because the data set sizes are always growing faster than the Viz, the Viz solutions. Mm -hmm. Another generic answer you can say is user studies. Right, formal user studies is a good, is a valid future. You can say this about every single data viz thesis again in the entire world. Another one you can say again about every viz thesis in the entire world is industry. You know, th this is especially true with yours though. A great future work direction is to employ this in industry. Right, to develop this to the, the TRL level 8, the technology readiness level that actually lets people use it in the industry. And this is an ongoing discussion. All three of these things are ongoing discussions in the visualization community because all of these amazing pieces of software have a, a tragic ending to them and, and, they, you know, and they don't get deployed by industry and so on. So that's a constant uh, discussion inside the visualization community. So those are those are three generic answers that anybody can use for any thesis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I think that's basically what your future work says. Yeah. I don't yeah, re I don't remember exactly either. Um, yeah, I think it pretty much is. Yeah. As you mentioned, really, it's like more perhaps individual points to different chapters, but yeah, that's it. Focused, Maybe exploring a few more visual designs, you know, is 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 good too. Um, in that sort of, you know, we, we didn't explore every visual design possible and, and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. No. This is all good. This is all good practice. Yeah. This is all good practice. Oh, how many other questions? Yeah, actually, I have a question. It's quite technical. So, might come out of that. But since you have, you mentioned that you have lots of data, and you are somehow using the data data to like project it in the 2D and you said you have lots of data why haven't you tried some kind of uh, dimensional reduction techniques since you have one maybe multi-dimensions data um it's a good question i think um for me a lot of multi-dimensional techniques you kind of lose uh, a sense of perspective and um, it's not so intuitive really and uh, for our audience so our um, uh, domain experts I think having some sort of multi-dimensional space which kind of doesn't really exist in reality is just something that's a bit um, unintuitive and you know to show for them to show people and for them to show their clients as well okay oh you've got to think of this as a as some sort of Real space. I think it doesn't necessarily come through so well in the outside of extreme expertise. Um, so more than anything, it would be unintuitive for uh, domain experts, really. Yep, that's a good answer. Uh, um, I just support that with the, the solutions we chose were the result of an ongoing feedback and discussion process with the domain experts. So we could have chosen dimensionality reduction techniques if the domain experts were interested in that. 
but they, they that's not one of the suggestions that they gave us. And Dylan is correct in the sense that dimensionality reduction techniques are very difficult to interpret. So once you have done your dimensionality reduction techniques, how do you actually interpret the results? And since the QPC analysts want to communicate their results to clients, they want to communicate their results to, to their bosses, to management, to customers, dimensionality reduction techniques might not be the best choice in that case. And the third answer to that aspect is if I wouldn't recommend it either because I think it's very difficult to find novel directions of research in the dimensionality reduction space. There have already been many, many papers published on this topic, and I would be very concerned about trying to do something novel in that space as well. So, yeah, it's kind of a three-prong answer. Good question, though. Very good question. Yeah, yeah, I have. So we know that you use C++ and Qt with secondary for developing your software. So why do you need to use any, any up-to-date platform like the website application? Maybe to write Qt, I think. Um, I wouldn't say you use C++ is outdated either. Um, <laughs> very much so is still used in industry. Um, as <laughs> I think um, web technologies are all kind of kind of hopping in some aspects, but they wouldn't work with the volume of data that uh, I have essentially. Um, QPCs themselves realize this, and it's one of the discussions we actually have with them. They are to use these streams as well with the volume of data we have. It's not really um, applicable, really, because it's quite a complex data set and to have that all into some sort of web platform but this can't be done really um, I think mean, D3 has some limitations essentially a lot of web applications do uh, I think they kind of were interested in some sort of uh, web um, GL type things but um, 